As we remember our Lord's death, the suffering and the anguish, the trepidation and the anxiety of the Garden of Gethsemane and the scourge and the praetorium and the cross of Golgotha. And we come to the time at this worship assembly that we're going to study together. I would encourage you to open a Bible. I would encourage you to get a Bible. If you don't have one, I've got I've got some with me. Grab one and let's study together. And please, whatever I say today, please look. When I give you a scripture reference, look for it. Don't you dare take my word for it. Prove me. Make sure the things that I say are so. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse number 21. Paul would say the same thing in Romans chapter 12. He would say that these individuals in Rome, they were to prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So I would ask you to do the same. So I'm going to go through and we're going to do a quick review of what we've talked about so far. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6 it says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. 4. Verse 7. Casting all your care upon him. 4. He cares for you. This is the basic sentiment of what we've been uh, studying so far is the very fact that God cares for us and he expects us to humble ourselves before him and he will provide for us everything that is needed. In Matthew chapter 5, the first gospel account written by the inspired Matthew, he would write uh, to a, a Jewish audience and he would express in the very first words coming out of the mouth of Jesus after his temptation in Matthew 4. Matthew 5 and verse 3 it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What is the idea conveyed in verse 3? Blessed are the poor in spirit. If you recall in Psalm 51, which is the backdrop Psalm 51 is the result of the events of 2 Samuel chapter 11 where David ought to have been with his army fighting a battle and instead is taking his ease in his house and he goes upon the roof and he sees the beautiful Bathsheba, the wife of his mighty man Uriah. And David, with a lustful heart, keeps on looking and not only commits adultery with Bathsheba but also murders her husband Uriah. What a terrible, tragic event. Nathan the prophet goes to David in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and rebukes him and demonstrates that David is the man who took away that beautiful little ewe lamb in that parable that he gives him. And he says, Thou art the man. You have killed an innocent man and you have taken his wife from him. What an awful thought. And it broke David's heart. So Psalm 51 is actually a result of this rebuke. And in Psalm 51 you can see the, the tenderness that is poured out in this. The idea that, that David is completely and totally relying upon God. You can see he says in verse 1, Have mercy upon me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. What is the emphasis? Is David trusting in himself here? Well, God, I know I've really messed up, but I know I can, I can get myself there. You know, I heard something recently. I heard that uh, some modern day Jewish uh, followers or followers of Judaism would say that they didn't need a Savior to redeem them. They can redeem themselves with their own righteousness. The idea that is never taught in any scripture, old or new. Is that David's attitude? Or is David one looking to the mercies of God, recognizing his failures? There's a constant theme in this psalm. David says he takes ownership of the problem and gives God complete respect in the fact that David doesn't have any solutions. God does. My sin, your mercy. He says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Purge me with hyssop. Verse 7. My sin is ever before me. Verse 3. Against thee the only have a sin. Verse 4. David acknowledges his sin. Who is the poor? Who are the poor in spirit but those that recognize their condition before God apart from God's righteousness and His mercy? Blessed are they that mourn. Who are they that mourn but those of verse 3 who recognize their condition? Who are the meek? Verse 5. But those 
of verses 3 and 4 who recognize that the only saving power in the universe, as Brother Jerry said a moment ago, is that of God, the blood of Jesus Christ. So we understand that in order for us to take advantage of the care that God has given us, the provisions that God has made, we have to humble ourselves. We have to recognize that His way is the right way. Jeremiah would write in Jeremiah chapter 10 that it's not in man who walketh to direct his steps. Verse 23. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who could know it? Disney says, Trust your heart. God says, Don't trust your heart. Follow me. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. The same idea is conveyed. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. The idea of humbling ourselves before God and His will. We looked at some examples. We looked at David in Psalm 51. We looked at Hezekiah. 2 Kings 19. The mighty military might of the world power of Assyria. You know, when Daniel interprets a dream for Nebuchadnezzar, he sees that statue. And there are four different materials this statue is made of. And the first is the old great king and the mighty might of Babylon. Well, there would be a kingdom coming after Babylon that would usurp them. We have uh, Assyria. Then we have the Persians, the Medo-Persian Empire. Then, of course, finally, what do we have? We've got Rome. But the military might of Assyria was coming against Judah and the walled cities. And Hezekiah prays a prayer in 2 Kings 19. And Hezekiah recognizes that he and his military are powerless against them. He would say in verse 19, save us out of his hand. Where is his reliance? 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Josaphat prays a very similar prayer. And in this prayer he would recognize we have no power and our eyes are on thee. What is the source of salvation? You know, a lot of our denominational friends get things wrong. They think that members of the Church of Christ believe that the water is what saves, that the power is in the water somehow, or the power is in our obedience somehow, or something like that. It's None of that's true. The reality is we understand that the, the source of salvation is God. But we also understand that there's no possible way to benefit from the source of salvation except for submitting to the requirements that he mandates. How could Naaman have been cleansed of his leprosy, 2 Kings 5, except to do exactly what the prophet said? Where was his trust? In the river? Was it in the Jordan River? Was it in the number 7, the times of the washings he was commanded? Or did he finally submit himself to the authority of this prophet of God and say, okay, I'll just do what you said. You know, as Peter, uh, in, in one of the gospel accounts, you have Peter that, and, and uh, his uh, partners in the fishing business, and the Lord walks up to them at the beginning of the calling of Peter and these apostles. And he says, let down on uh, one side or the other. And he said, Lord, we've told, we've told all the night long, nevertheless. At thy word, we'll do it. And of course, we know that they caught so many fish that almost the net break. And that's when he says, I'll make you fishers of men. The idea of at thy word. Well, because you said do it, Lord, I trust you and I'll do exactly what you say. Where's the, what are we looking to? Are we looking to ourselves as the ones responsible for saving or are we looking to God? You know the answer. It's pretty easy. What about Jesus in the garden? You know, the word agony in the King James is translated one time. Luke 22 and verse 44. And that's Christ in the garden. And he being in an agony. Not on the cross. I'm going to tell you something. There's, there's nothing that could prepare you for the pain of the cross. Nothing. Nothing. They've done tests where they would just tie people in a crucifix position. And after just a few minutes, the pain on your joints and your legs and your wobbling, weary muscles is excruciating. Not to mention being stretched in such a way that you would have to push up on those impaled heels every time you needed to breathe. Not even considering that. 
It's almost a good thing John 19.1's in there. Pilate therefore took him and scourged him. If it wasn't for the scourging, he would have probably lasted much longer. Thank God that he was only on the cross six hours. The scourging was so terrible. Just a savage event that have ripped him to pieces. Imagine seeing Christ after this scourging and he has ribbons of flesh hanging off his back. Imagine the blood is just pouring out of his body. Imagine seeing him so beaten and savaged that Isaiah looking through the epics of time would say in chapter 52 and verse 14 that his visage, his appearance was marred beyond that of any man. He was unrecognizable. Why'd he do it? He did it for me. He did it for you. I don't know about you, but as I was partaking of that, I was examining myself and I was finding myself so terribly undeserving. Why does he care for us so much? Genesis 1 verse 27 says, And God made man in his image. Matthew 16 and verse number 26, what would a man give? In exchange for his soul. Your soul is of more value than all the treasures of the world. One soul. If through the contribution of the Lord's church on the first day of the week, if we have funds set aside, and if we had to spend every drop, every dime, and it saved one soul, guess what? It would be a vast underpayment. We would, have, we would have gotten a really good deal. Doesn't matter how big the bank account is. Does it? One soul is of tremendous value. We ought to know that. We ought to act like it. We are the pinnacle of creation. In Psalm 8, Hebrews, the Hebrews writer would quote from this in the chapter emphasizing the reason why Jesus is superior. Hebrews 1 establishes a fact. Jesus is superior. Hebrews 2 tells you why. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For him that he put all in subjection under him, he, he left nothing that was not put under him. But we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels. Why? What does that mean? That means that the eternal spirit, the word, the eternal word, John 1.1, 1, 1, he dwelt in a human body. He was made lower than the angels. He was a physical being so that he could die. Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. If you look further down in Hebrews 2, right around verse 14, we see that he had to be made in the image of man. He had to be of the seed of Abraham. It behooved us. It, it was beneficial for us that he was made in the likeness of his brethren, that is, a human being, because he would die for us. Hebrews 2 emphasizes that truth. The reason why Jesus is superior is because of his role as a man. You remember when we were studying that chapter? And we, we asked the question, do you think God has to explain the fact that God is superior to man or anything else? No. Then why is it emphasized that Jesus was superior in chapter 2? Was it because he was God? No, even though he was God. But it was because he was a man. And that man lived sinless and offered himself for you. That's why it is called in Hebrews 1 right around verse 3 or 4. For he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Deity has never obtained anything. Deity has inherent to his character superiority in every way. So the only way that this makes sense is that he obtained something. That is, he did it by being a man. And he lived a sinless life and died for you. Therefore, God highly exalted him, Philippians 2, and gave unto him, gave unto him the name that is above every name. Right? That in the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow. Psalm chapter 8, verse 3, When I consider the heavens, the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Have you ever asked that question? I remember driving across the bay at night years and years ago, 
when I had to take Jada or drop her off and I see that beautiful moon rising on the, on the bay and it just, it brings tears to your eyes, doesn't it? Because you wonder, if you've created all of this, what am I? Well, do you know something? You know the reason he created all of that? For you. The heavens declared the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Question, to whom is his glory declared? If not you. God has demonstrated that he is by creation. God has revealed who he is through inspiration. What is man that thou art mindful of him? We are the pinnacle of creation. Listen to what he says. Thou hast made him a little, little lower than the angels. Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Man is the pinnacle of creation. These uh, atheists and these naturalists, these evolutionary folks, will tell you that man is a latecomer and that man's really inferior to all these creatures. Baloney. There's one way in which man is not inferior and it's the only way that matters. That is, you and I have volition and we understand the consequence of choice. We can make a choice even at our physical detriment for our spiritual well-being. There's not a creature on earth besides us that can do that. Can a dog sacrifice himself for you? Absolutely. Does the dog understand every aspect of it? Absolutely not. Not saying they're not valuable. They certainly are. But it's nothing like you and me. Ezekiel 33 and verse 11 says, Saying to them as I live, the prophet Ezekiel was prophesying to the nation of Judah who was suffering the consequences of their national sins. And in this context, Ezekiel in chapter 33 and verse 11 says this, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? If the denominational idea of God is correct, God could have just saved them anyway. Apart from any actions, motives, Thoughts, concerns of their own. God should have just saved them. Why can't God just save anybody? Anybody ever read Romans 3 and verse 24 through 26? Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation for our sins through His blood to declare His righteousness at this present time, that He might be just. Remember that word. That God might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Christ. God had to make a way to forgive man while it, it didn't contradict his nature. In other words, God who is perfect in justice had to make a way to forgive man that did not contradict that perfectly just nature. How could he do it? We sung the song this morning. He paid a debt, didn't he? He sent his son to die for you and that's the only possible way a just being could remain just and forgive the guilty. It required the innocent, didn't it? Didn't that break your heart? God doesn't want you to die. His care has been proven with giving every provision we can need. Brother Jerry mentioned that just a moment ago. Have you just thought about it? Can you really count your blessing? Do you, do you have enough time? Are you thankful for the air you breathe? Have you thought about it? We take things for granted so easily, don't we? Have you considered the lungs that God designed and, and placed in that womb all those years ago that have developed into those wonderful uh, tools today? Have you thought about it? You take it for granted, don't you? You take for granted every breath you take. But every breath you take ought to be in praise of God who gave it to you. Jesus says that you might be children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. God has given provision to everyone. Even the ones that blaspheme his name. Even the ones that use all the attributes and blessings and gifts from God. To curse him and to deny him and to disrespect him in every way. God still sends the sun and the rain upon the evil. What kind of world would it be if everybody acted that way? 
What kind of world would it be if everybody practiced New Testament Christianity? You could claim the Bible's faults all you want to. I don't think you'll claim that after about an hour of, about an hour of study with me. But you could claim whatever you want to. But let me ask you a question. Would the world be better if it practiced Christianity? Yes or no? I'm not talking about Catholicism. That's not Christianity. I'm talking about New Testament Christianity. If you treated your neighbor as yourself. If you fed and clothed and provided the needs of your enemy. What kind of world would it be? God wants the very best for us. God cares for us. He wants the best for us. Psalm 91 beginning in verse number 14. Because he hath set his love upon me. Therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him. And I will honor him. With long life will I satisfy him. And show him my salvation. Have you ever been distraught? Down in the dumps. Life is bad. You've lost your bank account. You've lost your, your husband or your wife. You've lost your child. You've lost your mother or your father. Things are terrible. It's just how can they possibly get any worse? That's the idea. Have you ever considered that? And have you, you, You've asked the question, why me? What did I do? Or God, why are you doing this to me? Maybe we ask those kind of questions. Those aren't really the right questions to ask, are they? Because in reality, God, God loves you so much He's given it to you. It's not always him, the one that's taking it away. You know, Job had the perfect attitude. Job lost his ten children. I've got one. And I would go out of my mind if I lost her. Can you imagine ten? But Job recognized that everything in the world that was his was given to him by God. And he came into this world with absolutely nothing. And he's going to leave with absolutely nothing. Therefore, everything he was given for the time he was given was a blessing. Have you thought about things that way? Doesn't that make you more appreciative? It ought to. God cares for you. When you're suffering, when you're going through difficulties, what about when you're struggling? What about when you fail? You're trying to withstand some temptation or difficulty and you're, you're withstanding and withstanding and then in, in some moment of weakness you give in to it. Do you think God cares? Do you remember the text we referenced a week or two ago about David bathing his couch in tears? Do you think in Psalm 51 as those words were penned that God looked down and He cared? The love that you have for your child is a drop in the proverbial bucket that the love of the love that God has for you. You cannot wrap your mind around the idea of infinite love. So just whatever you think about your closest, your favorite person on earth, multiply it times infinity and you've basically got how God feels about the worst, nastiest human being on earth. Right? In our view. That's how he feels about it. He loves you. God wants the best for you. Micah 6 and verse 8. He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what that the Lord required thee. But to do justly. And to love mercy. And to walk humbly with thy God. God wants the best for you. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, God wants everyone to be saved. Do you know that God's will is for everyone to be saved? you know Calvinism is centered upon the sovereignty of God? That's the idea behind it. And the idea is that what God wills, man can't do anything about. Well, that's not true. Read 1 Timothy 2, 4. God says, or Jesus, or the inspired apostle Paul would say, Who will have all men to be saved, speaking of God, and come to a knowledge of the truth? God's will is for every human being that has ever lived to be saved. But God's will will not contradict or, or impede with man's own free will. God wants man to be saved, but God will not make man be saved. He'll respect your choice. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. God wants the best for you, but God will respect your choice to reject Him. People ask that all the time. How can you believe in a God that sends people to hell? I don't believe in a God that sends people to hell. I believe in a God that respects your choice to choose hell. 
And unfortunately, that's the truth. It's just the way it is. 1 John 4 and verse 9, And this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved Him, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation. In the Septuagint, that is the same word spoken of in the Greek Old Testament of the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. The idea of appeasement. If you're talking about appeasement, then you're talking about wrath. That's from sin. Something had to make that right. What made it right? Well, the blood of Jesus. That's what made it right. 1 John 2.1 To offer salvation to those who absolutely don't deserve it. Guess what, folks? There's not a person in here that deserves it. Least of all me. But you don't deserve it either. I didn't say you weren't worthy of it. You deem yourself worthy or unworthy by your response to it. But you're absolutely undeserving of it. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 8. But God commendeth his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. That's Christ. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. That's again that idea of expiation or the idea of reconciliation. The idea of, of restoring fellowship at a certain price. 1 Timothy 2.6 says, He paid a ransom for us. If you don't leave here with anything else today, leave here with this. You ought to have some self-worth. You ought to have some self-esteem. Because God loves you. He loves you more than you can comprehend. He loves you more than you love anyone else. And He loves you so much. He's demonstrated that love by sending His Son to die for you. He sent the innocent, Jesus, to, to die for you and me, the guilty. His care is beyond comprehension. He cares when you're sad. He cares when you're happy. He cares when you, when you lose a loved one, you're bereaved. He, ca he cares when you're scared. He cares when you're young and when you're old. He cares. And it ought to give us a little bit of a comfort knowing that He cares for us. The ultimate demonstration of this love was that He sent His Son to die for you. Luke 12 and verse 32 says, Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure. To give you the kingdom. The kingdom was made possible by the death of Jesus Christ. Matthew 16 and verse 19. He died for you. Doesn't it encourage you to know that he loves you so much? But there are requirements if you want to benefit from this love. God has never said under any circumstance in any text. You can do whatever you want to and I'll accept it. God has said if you'll love me you'll keep my commandments. John 14 15. If you love and respect me, you'll do what I tell you to do, he says. We must first hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing God's word. Romans 10 and verse 17. Faith is not a product of your life experiences. Faith is not a result of a dream or your contemplation over life and all of its details. Faith is a result of man putting his nose in this book and learning the truth of the gospel. Through this book, John 20, verse 31, we have all the information we need concerning Christ. John 8, verse 24. Except you believe that I am, you shall die in your sins. The only way we can believe in Jesus is through His Word. John 20, verse 31. We must repent of our sins. Repentance is a change in mind. It's a change in will. It's a change in heart that leads to reformation of life. Acts 17, 30. God commands all men everywhere to repent. That means you. That means here. We have to acknowledge our faith in Christ. Romans 10 and verse 10. Confession is made with the mouth and it goes toward unto salvation. But under this point we've not been forgiven of sin. We've not been separated from sin. We've not contacted the blood of Jesus. We must be immersed, baptized for the remission of our sins. That's the purpose. By the authority of Jesus Christ. Acts 2 and verse 38. Those who do so are forgiven of all trespasses. Having been united with him in the likeness of his death and resurrection. Romans 6, 3 through 5. Colossians 2. 11 through 13. Those who obey the gospel are added to the one and only church 
and are restored in their fellowship with God. They are, uh, there is nothing separating them from God anymore. Their sin has been removed. We must remain in our faithfulness. 1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 2, and 1 John chapter 3. Walking in the light of His will. For those who have obeyed the gospel, if you're not faithful, repent. If you are willing to repent of your sin, God is willing to forgive, but He will not forgive without meeting His terms of pardon. We're going to offer an invitation song. If any have need, we would encourage you to repent of your sins. If you are a member that's erred from the truth, we would encourage you to obey the gospel if you've never done so. We're going to sing this invitation song as we do. Consider the words. The invitation is yours. Please come now as we stand and sing. <laughs>